Tonight's topic is what, CL? What are we going to be talking about tonight? Why isn't Muhammad ibn Abdullah of Arabia, Hijaz Arabia, why isn't he a prophet? Well, in one sense, he's a prophet, but not a true one, right? Well, yeah, he's called a prophet, so I guess yes, he's the prophet. The prophet. Yes, the prophet of all prophets yeah. who's supposed to be the leader, the master of all the messengers, right? They call him Sayyid, uh, Sayyid al Mursaleen. Mm -hmm. When they pray for him, they mention that he's Sayyid al Mursaleen, the Lord, the master of the sent ones, meaning that God forbids such blasphemy, such filth. From a Christian perspective, this is wicked to say it. So Muslims understand when you say that, you offend us. We understand that this is because you have been led to believe that he's a prophet. To say that Muhammad is the Lord, the master of the sent ones, means that he's also, God forbid, such blasphemy, the master of Christ. And he's not the master of Christ. He's beneath Christ. He's under the feet of Christ. And Christ is his Lord, God, master, creator, sustainer, as well as executioner. Because the Bible teaches that, and because we believe in the Bible, that's the position we take. Anyone who comes after the Lord Jesus claiming to be a prophet that contradicts the message of Christ and his followers cannot be a true prophet. He's a false prophet, and he's under the feet of Christ. So this is not just true of Muhammad. This would be true of Joseph Smith, Murza Ghulam Ahmed, Elijah Muhammad, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Baha'u'llah, Babylon. All of them are under the feet, the glorious feet of Jesus Christ. So we're going to be discussing why as Bible-believing Christians, and I need to qualify that, mm -hmm. Bible committed Christians, and I say it with a sigh, because there are many so-called Christians out there that will tell you that Muhammad was a prophet, he was a good man, we should leave Muslims alone and not antagonize them. Well, let me tell you something. If you claim to be a Christian, that means you derive your authority from the God-breathed scriptures, the revelation that God has given. According to the scriptures, we are commanded by the Lord Jesus to make disciples of all nations. That includes Muslims. And according to the scriptures, we are to expose the evil deeds. Right? All evil deeds, the fruits of darkness. That's Ephesians 5.11. And according to scriptures, we are always to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within us. To whoever asks, yet do so with gentleness and reverence. I'm still working on the gentleness part by the grace of God. So bear with me, I'm a work in progress. That's 1 Peter 3.15. For the reference, 1 Peter 3.15. The one where it says, expose their evil deeds that they do in the dark. Ephesians 5.11. And where does it say make disciples of all nations? Matthew 28, 19. So if you believe Jesus, you believe the Bible, you have no choice but to pray for Muslims and evangelize them and refute their attacks against scriptures and show why Muhammad is not a true prophet. So don't tell me you're a Christian, but you're budding up with Muslims and don't want to tell them the truth of the gospel. You'd rather have them love you and let them go to hell than love them enough to tell them the truth, risking even your friendship. I'd rather get a Muslim angry with me and uh, angry enough to go study the true claims of Christianity, and hopefully he gets saved, then tickle his ears and tell him what he wants to hear. As I see him, off, you know, off to hell he goes. That's not love. That's, that's, that's but, uh, hold on. It's evil. Let, let me play devil's advocate for a second. You, you would be an excellent devil, by the <laughs> way. But see, I think, I think oh, yeah. that if you're nice to people and you're kind to people yeah. and you're loving to people, you get, don't you get more bees and, and ants yeah. with honey than you yeah, get with vinegar? Idea. Well, it is true that as Christians, when we preach the gospel, we should do so with love, you know, humility and compassion for the other person, to see that person as being deceived, blinded, and love that person, see him as a victim, not as the enemy. Because like I said in previous programs, and I mean this, Muslims for the most part are victims. Hmm. They're not enemies. But that doesn't excuse them when they blaspheme, they insult and throw filth against the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they need to be held accountable. So it is true in one sense we need to love them and be compassionate towards them. But that doesn't mean that we love them to the point that we compromise truth. Because if I really love someone, and I know he's diseased to the point he's about to die, and I know that this medicine I have is his only hope of living, then it would be very unkind, unloving for me to withhold his only hope of being healed. Well, sin is a spiritual disease. It's a spiritual cancer. It's eating up all mankind. The only solution right, to this cancer called sin is the holy blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which he shed on Calvary's cross. And a Muslim needs to know that. Say, say, hey, you're dying. In fact, you're already dead. And only Christ, the risen Lord, can speak life to your dead body, to your dead soul, to your dead spirit, to your dead, dead mind. You need Jesus because he's the only one that can give you resurrection life because mm. he is the one who's risen. And he is life, and he's all-powerful. And by his powerful word, he sustains all creation. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. So no, it's not being Christ-like just to love them. Just love them. 
Who cares what they believe? Well, if you believe Jesus, then you should care what they believe because Islam is a one-way ticket to hell. As is atheism, as is agnosticism, as is Mormonism, as is Jehovah's Witnesses. The only path, the only hope, the only way for eternal life, for forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God is the Lord Jesus Christ and His cross, the cross of Calvary, where He paid the debt of sin that we had to pay but could not do so. So in other words, either Jesus is Lord and King, exactly. and everything that opposes him as Lord and King, any philosophy, Got it. any worldview, any ideas out there, any ideologies that oppose his kingship sends you to hell. You better believe it. In fact, it's interesting you said ideologies, right? Yes. Let me show you what the blessed apostle Paul, our brother in the Lord Jesus, this blessed and holy servant of Christ. And Paul was nothing apart from Christ. Everything good that he was is because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you what Paul says about philosophy that seeks to undermine the glory of Christ and his gospel. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, because you mentioned philosophy. Interesting, you do that. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, vain, and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces, spirits, meaning the spirits that have taken this this world captive until Christ dethrones them and sends them to hell, right? Rather than on Christ. Don't let anyone deceive you with hollow, deceptive philosophy that's not based on Christ and his revelation, but on human tradition. For in Christ, and in Christ alone, all the fullness of the deity, that which makes God God, lives in bodily form. Since he's truly and fully God with a physical body, you have everything you need and then some in Christ and your relationship and your love to him. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of over every power and authority. Another one, Galatians 1, 6 to 9. A group of so-called Jewish Christians deceiving people into following another gospel. Did Paul say, just let's love them. You know, faith is subjective. It doesn't matter what they believe. Just love them. Let's see what Paul says. And if you claim to be a Christian and your message is just love them, you know, let them continue be, being Muslims, well, they have the right to be what they want. I can't force them to be Christians. I can't kill them. But shame on you if you don't preach the gospel to them. The Lord will rebuke you on the day of judgment. This is in Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Paul, this blessed and holy slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, says this to believers in regards to the Judaizers, these so-called Jewish Christians who are trying to deceive them, take them captive by following a different gospel. Notice what Paul says. And you can't be more Christian than the very apostles and prophets whom God used to give you the Christian faith. I'm astonished. This is Galatians 1, 6 to 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the unmerited favor, the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel, good news, which is really no good news at all. There's only one good news, the good news that Jesus revealed through his blessed apostles and prophets. Any other so-called so good news is bad news because it will damn your soul to hell. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. They're perverting it. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we have preached to you, let them be anathema, anathema, eternally condemned, accursed. So Christian, don't tell me that you're a Christian if you don't preach with the same boldness and conviction that Paul preaches because Paul puts everyone under the wrath of God that deliberately perverts the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, he repeats it in verse 9, Galatians 1, 9. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you've accepted, let them be under God's curse, anathema, anathema, eternally condemned. Mm. So again, if you're going to be a Christian, you can't be more of a Christian than the apostles and prophets that Jesus gave us to give us the revelation from heaven. So this is the stance I take. It's not because I hate Muslims, it's because I love them enough to tell them, you're wrong, you need Jesus. And those Muslims want to blaspheme, be careful because I will give you a taste of your own medicine to teach you because even according to the Quran CL, chapter 6, verse 108, this is what the Quran tells you Muslims. I'm not quoting it because I believe it, but you believe it. I exhort you to adhere to it because it says, do not mock their gods. Do not insult their gods, lest in ignorance they insult Allah. Do not blaspheme my Lord. Do not insult my Lord. Do not attack and disrespect the scriptures. And if you don't do so, then I'll treat you with, with kindness and love. Otherwise... I'm going to have to rebuke you. And there's a Amen. place to rebuke. I know some Christians don't like to, to, to hear that. Plenty of passages, but that's not the topic for tonight. The topic is, 
What is the evidence from the scriptures that prove that Muhammad can't be a true prophet? Now, before I give you the time to make your case or ask a, a question or comment, let me give the number for those of you who have questions. The number is 248-416-1300. 248-416-1300. Call us if you have questions, especially if it's related to the topic. CL, Muhammad claimed to be a true prophet. Muslims believe he's a true prophet. Why is it we don't accept him as a prophet of God? Well, first of all, before we get into that, I just want to make it perfectly clear to squash any uh, argument or objection because Second Corinthians 10 and 5 so tells us to throw down every imagination and speculation that comes against Christ. That anyone who thinks that this show is about um, abusing Muslims yes. or hurting the feelings and the, and the beliefs of Muslims or doing something to Muslims that just is unjust, that we're just here and the cameras are here and, the, and we're broadcasting because we didn't have anything else to do besides you know, taunt and mock Muhammad and taught and mocked uh, Muslims for what they believe. That is completely incorrect and wrong. That's not why I'm here. That's not exactly. why Sam is here. Exactly. We're here to obey the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We're here to obey the commandments from the Lord. The Lord tells us we destroy arguments and every lofty Amen. opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive Amen. to obedience to Christ, 2 Hallelujah. Corinthians 10 and 5. Hallelujah. That's why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, why... Which person in his right mind would want to have people attack them, attack him or her, insult him or her, threaten to kill them, and harm their families? Anyone in the right mind? That doesn't sound uh, <laughs> logical to me. If you're, if you're me. abnormal, you're insane, yes. But we have no choice but to proclaim the truth. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, says, if they hated him, they'll hate us as well. Mm -hmm. And he says, the world cannot love him. The world hates him because he testifies that its deeds, its deeds are evil. John 7, 7. And we're told that if they accepted his message, they'll accept ours. And if they reject his message, they'll re reject ours. John 15, 18 to 19. So the Bible quite clearly tells us that this gospel, by its very nature, is offensive to disbelievers until the Holy Spirit opens their minds to see that it's true and their only hope of salvation. So this is part of following Christ. This is part of loving him more than loving yourself. This is part of carrying your cross. And I say he's worthy. And as long as he gives us the power to do it, We'll continue to do it for the glory of Christ. Amen, amen. Now, you, you asked me a simple question. Why don't we accept Muhammad as a prophet? You don't accept Muhammad as a prophet. No. I used to accept Muhammad as a prophet. Then I stopped. Amen. You know, um, why, would I, why, why, why would I do something like that? Why exactly. would you do why that? Would you do why, would, why do Bible-believing, born-again, regenerate Christians not accept Muhammad as a prophet? I don't have a coexist bumper sticker on the back of my car. <laughs> like the guy who got carjacked by uh, Joe Carr and Tamerlan in yeah, Boston. <laughs> <laughs> one, actually, one of the guys, the, they carjacked someone, and on the back of his Mercedes Benz, he had the sticker, Coexist, mm. on the back of his sticker. Well, they, sure, they truly appreciated that, huh? Oh, well, <laughs> I don't think they stopped to read it. <laughs> but if they did, they didn't really care. Yeah. Um, I would love to, I coexist. I, my next door neighbors are Muslims. I have Muslims in my neighborhood. I have Muslims in my family. I coexist on a human level with Muslims. I work with Muslims. I don't do anything to them. I don't uh, uh, try to get them fired for my job or anything like that. I would never do anything like that. That, that would be against the teachings of Christianity and Christ for me to do that. Yeah. Um, I pray for them and I love them. But I still have to speak the truth in love. Hallelujah. Truth and love. See that? Truth and love. It's not just love without truth. And it's not just truth without love. We speak the truth in love. We do both. We don't compromise either one. Amen. So when I can say with truth and love that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is a false teacher mm. and a false prophet who is in hell and he is leading billions and trillions of human beings into hell after him. He's a prophet of Satan. Mm. He's not a prophet of Yahweh, yeah, God exactly. of the Bible. Yes, and how, do you, how can we determine that, uh, that he's not a prophet of Yahweh but of Satan? Is there any criteria that the Bible gives uh, to determine a true prophet from a false one? So in other words, you just said the evidence led you to conclude by the grace of God's spirit he's a prophet of Satan. Now, that may be offensive, and I know Muslims get offended, but hear us out. Just like you Muslims would have no hesitation saying Joseph Smith is a false prophet of Satan, just like you Muslims would have no hesitation saying Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who comes in the 19th century, late 1800s, dies in 1905, who comes after Muhammad, started out as a Muslim, but ends up claiming to be a prophet after Muhammad, 
and the Indian Messiah, that he is the Messiah who is to come, because Jesus' Messiah is not returning, you would have no hesitation to say that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is a liar, a deceiver, a false prophet, a child of Satan. Likewise, from a Christian perspective, you have to understand where we're coming from. Any prophet after Jesus who contradicts the message of Christ, we have no choice but to say he's an antichrist, a false prophet, empowered by Satan. So although it may be uh, uh, offensive to you, put yourself in our shoes, just like you would tell an Ahmadiyya, someone who follows Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, hey, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is a false prophet. And your intention is to get that person to abandon him. Or you'd say to someone who's Baha'i, hey, Baha'u'llah, false prophet, Joseph Smith, false prophet, used of Satan. From a Christian perspective, Muhammad also is a false prophet used of Satan because he perverted the gospel. He's under the wrath of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul said. So understand our perspective. This is what we believe. And we believe it to the point of proclaiming it as well as dying for it by the grace of Jesus because Christ is real. He is risen. So please try not to be offended. Try to listen, hear us out, examine the evidence, and ask God to show you. Are these people speaking the truth? If not, protect me from them and expose them. But if they speak the truth, open my heart to accept whoever you are. And if you're the God revealed and your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, then I accept wholeheartedly. So with that said, what's the criteria, man? Well, the criteria is not just my imagination. It's not how I feel on the inside. It's not, you know, something I have against Muhammad. It's something that we can actually measure. We can confirm from objective truth and fact. The Bible gives us a perfect measurement of, of, of looking at anyone who claims to be a prophet or who's called to be a prophet, who's called as a prophet. We can take that person, what they say and what they do, and measure it against objective truth, an objective truth claim inside the Bible, and we can see for certain if this person is a prophet or not a prophet. So you're saying the Bible's a standard? The Bible. Yeah, but I can already hear the Muslims object. No, no, the Bible is not objectively true. That's your subjective feelings. That's your whims and desires. The Bible has been corrupted. Just to confirm that what he says should be something Muslims accept because their own scripture says the Bible is objective truth. And it's actually the criterion that God gives Christians as well as Muslims mm -hmm. to use in order to determine whether the Quran is revelation from God. Let me show you what the Quran itself says about the Bible itself being objectively true, not simply subjective, not just because I believe it's true, it is truth, and it's the truth that you're supposed to use to determine whether the Quran is true. Let me show you what the Quran says about appealing to the Bible to determine the veracity of the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 47, speaking to the Christians at Muhammad's time. Chapter 5, verse 47. Muslims, this is in your own book. So if you want me to follow the Quran, the Quran is telling me, use my gospel to judge. But if I use my gospel to judge, then Muhammad is a false prophet. Chapter 5, verse 47 says this. Let the people of the gospel, Ahl al -Injil, him and I, I'm the people of the gospel, I believe in the gospel. This is directed to me. Let the people of the gospel judge by what that which God has revealed in it. In what? The gospel. Whoever does not judge by that which God has revealed, such are evil livers. Do you see what the Quran says? If I as a Christian fail to judge by my gospel, I am an evildoer, an evil liver. So again, the Quran is telling me, use my gospel to judge. Judge who? Judge what? Anything and everything, even the claims of Muhammad. Muslims, unfortunately, for your belief, by doing what the Quran says, judging by the gospel, I am left with no conclusion other than Muhammad is a false prophet. However, I'm not the only one told to judge by the gospel. Muslims, including Muhammad, were told to appeal to the people of the Bible, the Jews and Christians who had the scriptures before Muhammad, to determine whether the Quran is true or not. Where am I getting this from? Chapter 10 of the Quran, verse 94. Chapter 10, verse 94 says this. If you, Muhammad, chapter 10, verse 94, if you, and it's singular, you, Muhammad, now if this is addressed to Muhammad, how much more his followers? If you, Muhammad, are in doubt concerning that which we reveal unto you, if you're doubting whether this is revelations from God, then question those who've been reading the scripture before you, the book before you. Ask the Jews and Christians who have the Bible and ask them to see whether the Quran is true. Verily the truth from your Lord has come unto you, so be not of those who weigh from their faith, who are, who are doubtful. Problem with this passage, if you Muslim come to me and ask me whether the Quran is true, according to my scripture, I have no choice but to tell you no. The Quran is a false book. It's only true when it agrees with the Bible. When it contradicts the Bible, it is false. Since it contradicts the core essential teachings of the Bible, Muhammad is a false prophet. So if I take the Quran seriously, I have no choice, and you have no choice, 
but to use the Bible as the criterion to determine whether the Quran is true. And once you do, the only conclusion you can arrive at, Muhammad is a false prophet. So I just mm. want to show you, mm. what you just said that the Bible is objectively true, is confirmed by the Quran itself, and if Muslims believe it, they must agree with you. So Muhammad told the, the Christians, the people of the book of his day, he spoke to them. Yes. Because that was revelation that was given down for certain circumstances, right? That's right. It wasn't just some, you know. It was the, the you know, Jews and Christians of his day who were trying to come to him. The Jews specifically says, hey, don't come to me. You got the Torah. The only time you come to me is when you become Muslim. Then you can come to me. If so not, he sent them back to their scriptures yeah, that's to refer chapter to. Chapter five, yep. But we don't, we don't actually have that today, do we? So let's, let's figure this out. Muhammad is appealing to the scriptures that the Jews and Christians of his time had access to. Yes. Because he's telling you, Jew, don't come to me. Go to your Torah, meaning the Torah was available. And he's telling you Christians, judge by the gospel that you have. So he's talking about people who actually had the gospel in their possession. Mm. And chapter 7, verse 157, further confirms they had the Torah in their gospel in their possession at the time of Muhammad. Because look mm. what chapter 7, verse 157 says. So Muslims can't get around this. They can't pull up the canard, the Bible's corrupt. Well, if you use that argument, toss out the Quran. Chapter 7, verse 157, notice what it says. Speaking to Muhammad's contemporaries. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, who can neither read nor write, well, I would debate that translation, but be that as it may, whom they will find described in the, in the Torah and the gospel with them. With them. So at the time Muhammad, Muhammad is saying, your Torah and gospel that you have supposedly contains prophecies of Muhammad, which we'll look at and demonstrate the only prophecies about Muhammad is that he's a false prophet. Now the question is, what was the Torah and what was the gospel that the Jews and Christians at Muhammad's time possessed? You don't need to guess. The manuscript evidence. We have thousands of manuscript copies of the Old Testament books and the New Testament books in various languages. In fact, when it comes to New Testament, we have approximately 25,000 copies of the individual New Testament books, 5,700 plus in Greek, the original language of the New Testament, whether fragmentary copies or whole codices that were written before, during, and after the time of Muhammad that are virtually identical. So the only gospel that the Christians at Muhammad's time would have had is the gospel that we have today, and we know that because of the manuscript evidence. Same thing with the Torah. So as far as archaeology is concerned, manuscript evidence is concerned, there is no way to get around the fact that the only gospel and Torah that the Jews and Christians would have had access to, which Muhammad exhorts them to use to judge him by, are what you possess today. Can't oh, get around that. Okay. Well, okay. So let's do what the Quran tells us to do. Exactly. Let's go to the scripture that, mo that Allah revealed. This is supposed to be Allah's word, right? Yeah. So if we go to Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and we go to chapter 18, and let's say we start at verse 20 through 22. Mm -hmm. Now before this point, God gives a command to the Israelites to obey the prophets. And prophets would come to them in the mode of Musa, Moses. Then right after this, this is the words of Almighty God. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Verse 21. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken. Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, Yahweh, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that Yahweh, Lord, has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuous, presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So don't fear him, huh? No fear He's a of him. False prophet and should be put to death. Put to death. So according to this criterion, because God gives us criteria, plural. But this specific criterion demonstrates that Muhammad cannot be a true prophet. Now, before we look at some of the reasons why, because notice, it says if this prophet says something doesn't happen, he's a false prophet. And there's evidence that exactly that's what happened to Muhammad. Let me give you the other part of the criteria. That was one criterion. Let me give you a twofold criteria. One is he says things that don't come to pass, and he attributes it to God. The other is you'll know a false prophet by his fruits. In other words, a false prophet will bear evil, nasty fruits. Mm. And unfortunately for the Muslims, and I don't mean to offend you, the Quran and the traditions are replete with examples of evil, nasty, immoral fruits that Muhammad ordained and himself practiced. And we'll look at that.
Let me read Matthew 7, 15 and 20. And I think we have a few callers, so we may take some of them. Okay. Matthew 7, 15 to 20. Here's the twofold criteria to know whether Muhammad is a prophet, true prophet or a false one. And this is true for any other so-called prophet. You can use this to examine Joseph Smith, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam, Baha'u'llah. The, these criteria are ap applicable to any and all prophets who come after Jesus with a different message. Watch out for false prophets. This is Jesus speaking. Watch out for false prophets. Now, Jesus, how, how can I know a false prophet from a true one? Here it is. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Their fruits will testify whether they're of God or not. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The obvious answer is no. Right? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. In order to know Muhammad, whether Muhammad is a true prophet or not, we have to examine his fruits, his actions, his deeds and instructions. And again, my heart goes out to Muslims. Muhammad's deeds, I'm not saying every deed. There are some things that were admirable because he did a borrow from Judeo-Christian ethics and morality. Yeah. But there are things that were abominable, horrendous, and grossly immoral, such as temporary marriages, muta, and taking captive women and raping them even though their husbands were still alive. And we'll get into that. But before I do that, did you want to add something before we take the first caller? I just want to add something to, to what you're just saying. This is the second criteria. You would know them by their fruits. That's for prophets. That's for individual people. Anyone who claims that they know God and they're speaking about God, examine their fruit. So examining the fruit of the prophet is something you should do. It's not being needlessly uh, damning or putting down that person or that prophet or that message or that religion. That's right. Right? Exactly. I agree. So that's not what we're doing here. We're just being fruit inspectors. <laughs> exactly. Let's look at the fruit. <laughs> you better believe it. I like that. I love that. Fruit Jesus inspectors. gives us the authority to be fruit inspectors, Matthew 7, 15 to 20. I like that. In fact, I like it so much that unfortunately we're going to have to take a break because my time for the first break is up. Lord willing, we'll get to some callers, but also be patient with us because we have to examine some of Muhammad's false prophecies and his evil fruits. Otherwise, we're never going to get to the evidence showing that Muhammad is a false prophet. So do bear with us, and I want to make sure that CL gets ample time to make his case and that I have some time to make my case, as well as take your calls. But we'll do that after the break if the Lord Jesus wills. All right, we're back after the break, and I pray by the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, we'll do justice to the topic of why Muhammad cannot be a true prophet according to the criteria given by inspired scriptures of the only true God that exists, Yahweh Elohim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior who lives. Now, before we do that, before we get into the evidence, I know we have a few callers waiting, so I'll try to take a couple of them. However, do... Do be patient with us. We can't take all the calls one after the other because we do have to return to the topic and give some evidence. We're going to be fruit inspectors by the grace of God yes. using the Bible as the criterion because the Quran tells us to use the Bible. Yes. And we're going to expect the fruits of Islam. And you'll see, well, I hope you'll see, if you bear the image of God, although tainted by sin, still it hasn't been effaced. If you bear the image of God, you have the law of God written in your hearts and you'll see, you'll just realize that these fruits are evil and Muhammad can't be a true prophet of God. Now that said, let's take the first caller. Before the show is over. <laughs> before our time is up. Can't hear. Hello? Yes, can you turn down the volume to your internet can or your you TV? Me? Yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Oh, hello. hi. How are you doing? God bless you. What's your question, friend? Can't hear oh, you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Devin. I'm calling out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I just had a question as far as with Muhammad. Yes. Um, he, okay, so he was a false, so he was a false prophet, and that's proven. Okay. Um, my thing is, my, my, my comment is if you can just pray for a close friend of mine, uh, my girlfriend actually, uh, her name is Lakaya. She actually is a Muslim, and, uh, you know, I, I give her truth. Uh, by the Spirit of God um, that He stowed upon me, you know. Yes. And I just ask that you guys just pray for her. Um, but what's her yeah, name? I, I, her name What's is Rakaya. 
Okay. Rukaya? Rukaya. Yeah, Rukaya. And you said you're a believer and she's your girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let, as, as a brother, take this as brotherly advice from a brother who loves you because you said you're a believer. Because you're a believer, I'm duty-bound, I'm bound to the Lord to share, you what the, share with you what the scriptures teach. First of all, we'll be praying for salvation because we want to see every Muslim get saved, especially your girlfriend. But as a brother to a brother, I hold you to the standard of scripture. None of us live perfectly. None of us here can say we live the scriptures perfectly. But we strive by the Holy Spirit to try to live the commands of the Lord perfectly. Let me give you some brotherly advice because I hear this often. I hear about Christian men dating non-Christians or Christian women dating non-Muslims. That's a no-no. 1 Corinthians 15.33, let me give you some scriptural advice. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. How much more when you're going out with a woman whom you're, you plan on marrying and being intimate with, if she's a disbeliever, it's going to affect your walk with the Lord, especially if you have children. That's 1 Corinthians 15.33. But 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18, speaks to your issue even more explicitly. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14-18, here's what it says, my brother, and I pray by the Holy Spirit you receive it, because it's scriptural. If not, then I pray the Lord mercifully, mercifully and gently leads you to repentance, because this is what the scripture teaches. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. And it's not just for you. Anyone listening who's in a relationship with a non-Muslim, that's a no-no. I'm sorry, a non-Christian. My bad, I'm sorry. Non-Christian, no-no. And secondly, if you're sold out for Christ, you must maintain sexual purity. The Bible forbids premarital sex. Where? 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 5, Paul says, that he, he, his desire would be that all of us remain celibate so he can be undivided in serving the Lord. He goes, however, not everyone has this gift. Not everyone's given the gift to be celibate. So he says, if you burn with passion, notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 5, each man should have his own wife, doesn't say girlfriend, and each woman should have her own husband, doesn't say boyfriend. If you're burning with passion, pray to God to give you the grace to control it until you find a godly wife or a godly husband. But no sex, no physical intimacy before marriage, that's a no-no. Now in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18, and this is for you and everyone else who may be in the same situation that you are. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Marriage is a yoking of two people who come together and become one flesh in the sight of God. This is applicable to marriage, not just your friendships. If it's telling you don't have unbelievers as friends where you revolve your life around, how much more does this apply to women that you want to marry or men that you want to marry? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Nothing. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It can't. Because the moment you turn on the light, there goes darkness. Darkness is the absent of, absence of light. You can't have light and darkness in fellowship. Because one cancels out the other. And you are light. She's darkness until the Lord saves her, right? right? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Does Christ sit and have fellowship with Belial? Sip tea with Belial? God forbid such blasphemy. Christ has no fellowship with Belial. Belial stands condemned by the Lord Jesus. So then what right do you have to, bond, to, be, one, to be yoked with an unbeliever when it comes to husband and wife relationship? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Answer, nothing. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? No agreement. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, and I pray that you receive this, and everyone Amen. else listening receives this Amen. by the Holy Spirit. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Notice, you who are part of the world, Come out of the world, separate from the world, and God will receive you. If you fellowship with the world, then you'll be stained. You'll become unclean and bring the discipline of the Lord over you in your life. And you don't want to be disciplined of the Lord, do you? Finally, verse 18, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. My advice to you, brother, let her go. You're not her savior. You can't open her eyes or her heart. Let her go. Entrust her to Christ, pray for salvation, walk on. 
Christ is their Savior. The Holy Spirit will open our heart and minds. The Holy Spirit doesn't need you to do it, especially when you're in a relationship that's contrary to the revealed will, will of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not honor that, but he'll discipline you. So I pray you receive that, and I pray by the God's Spirit you're convicted to do what is right. Let her go. Is Jesus worthy that you give up everything, even your own life for him? Amen, he is. Then you need to be willing to give up this relationship because it's contrary to Scripture. It grieves the Holy Spirit of God. So, Lord, bless you, brother. I hope you take those passages to heart and may the Lord move you to act upon it in obedience as a sign that you truly love the Lord more than yourself. And I pray that for all of us, that we truly obey the Amen. Lord for his glory. Amen. Now, with that said, I'll take another caller. Another caller, then we'll impact the data. Next caller. We got a next caller? Hi. Hi. How are you today? By the grace of God, I'm wonderful. As long as I'm in love with Jesus, I'm blessed. I just, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for all your work. Um, Amen. You know, Amen. It's, it's been a few months that I, I've actually uh, been able to tolerate you, <laughs> being uh, coming from Islam. Coming oh, you from used to be a Muslim? Muslim? I used to be a Muslim. Glory to Jesus, you come to know Jesus. We pray the Lord preserve you in his love forever. Praise God. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Um, I just, I wanted to make a few points. I've sure. lately been bombarded with my family um, and uh, questions and, of course, you know, accusations of how I could dare possibly question the prophet of, you know, the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, <laughs> You know, so um, I, I just, it, it's really, it's gotten a little bit hard for me. And um, I just want to know what your opinion is on, on how to approach it in a way that maybe it might click with them a little bit better than it has been. Yeah. Uh, first of all, expect that you're going to go through tribulation with family members because that's what Jesus said. He said, count the cost. In fact, I'll read it for you. Matthew 10, verses 34, all the way to 39. I'm going to read what the Lord says about your situation, because he's talking about people like you who have to leave one religious tradition to follow Christ and the persecution that results from doing so. This is what he says to you. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Now he's not talking about a physical sword, but a metaphorical sword, as the context makes plain. Here's the sword that Jesus is talking about. For I've come, for I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And that's what you're facing right now. Because Jesus brought you to himself, now your family members have turned against you. This is what he means that he came to bring a sword. Because whether you like it or not, if you follow Christ and the members of your family don't do so, they will persecute you. But now Jesus says this to you. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. If your parents' affection means more than Jesus, Jesus says, you're not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And cross is a painful instrument. It was one of the most painful ways to die. So Jesus is saying, following me is going to be painful. It's not going to be a walk in the park, but I'm worthy and I'll give you the power to endure the pain until you enter his glorious presence. That's Jesus' promise to you. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So you're going through exactly what Jesus said you'd go through because you followed Christ and your family members haven't. If it gets so bad where you can't live there, my advice would be to relocate, move somewhere where you find godly Christians who love you, surround you, and be a community to you, pray for you, and help you in your struggle. Because that's what the church is. Find a solid church that really believes in the teachings of Christ, because those people will surround you and be there for you prayerfully as well as emotionally and if need be, even financially. They're there. Find them wherever you live. Secondly, the way you win your family to Christ is by your transformed life. If they don't see no difference between what you were and what you are now, then to them, all you did was abandon one religion for another. But if they see a true inward transformation, where you're not like you used to be. You're much more loving, much more compassionate, much more, you know, just passionate and, and have no doubt that you're on the path to salvation. That transformation will leave an impact upon them more so than just your words. I'm not saying don't preach. 
But if your preaching is not tolerated, then preach by your actions, and by your actions, God's Spirit will use it to get their attention and then come to you and say, you know what? We've seen you all these years. You're different. You're not that same girl that, you know, that was that troublemaker or that disrespectful person. You're not miserable like you used to be. You're, you're not depressed like you used to be. You're not full of hate. What happened to you? And that's when you can tell them, Jesus happened to me. And what, he can do to me what he did for me, he can do for you. That would be my advice for you, sister. That's my advice. Now, CL, I, I want... appreciate that. That, that helps. Let's see. I'll also add something because he used to be a former Muslim. What happens to you when you have former Muslim or Muslims who are in your life who see you and persecute you? What, is, what do you do and how do you respond and what would, you, would be your advice to her? Um, I understand what you're going through. Uh, this is going to happen to anyone who le leaves Islam or leaves any um, false ideology for Jesus Christ. When I left Islam, I had my best friend in the world curse me in the name of Allah <laughs> uh, and cut off all contact with me. All, all my friends, all the people that I spent daily time with who um, I thought were there for me, and when I tried to still keep a contact with them, I didn't just cut them off. I wanted to stay in contact with them um, as friends and even have dialogue with them, but they cursed me in the name of Allah. They, they prayed for Allah to destroy me mm. and to kill me. <laughs> um, they, they didn't return my calls. They unfriended me on Facebook and all these other things. They went around telling people that I had been possessed by a jinn, mm. that I was majnoon, that I went crazy. Um, so this is, you have to expect this to happen, yes. um, unfortunately. These are your loved ones, and you love them, and they love you, but uh, this is spiritual. There's a spiritual battle going on, something you may not see with your eyes or perceive with your ears and through the senses. So I, you need to stay prayed up. Amen. You need to stay on your knees praying. beseeching the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. You need the Holy Spirit to indwell you, to transform your heart. Because walking as a Christian is the hardest thing in the world. This walk as a Christian that I've been on for two years is harder than trying to keep the Quran and Sunnah. Because keeping the Quran and Sunnah and being a Muslim, that's something I did externally. Going to the mosque for Ramadan, and that, that's something you just do externally. But being a Christian is something you do internally, exactly. right? I have to constantly, every day, repent and check myself internally. And that's ten times harder than trying to follow the Sunnah. Yeah. You know, so you need to beseech the Lord. You need to storm the, the, the throne of Almighty God to ask him to give you the power to continue to Amen. walk every day as a yeah. Christian exactly. and not fall away and not fall back. And that backslide. Yeah, yeah. And like I said earlier, you need to speak the truth in love. We have truth yeah. and we have love. It, we don't have one or the other. So you come with truth and love. You need to love them, regardless of what they do or what they say to you. Just like Christ loved his enemies, he commanded us to love our enemies. You, these are your family members, not your enemies. But if they behave like enemies towards you, you need to just show them love. So when they curse you, you bless them. When they pray Amen. against you, we pray for them. Transform life, yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So you have to just walk in the spirit and pray for that spirit to be upon you. And I just pray for you. And I, and I pray that the Lord gives you that power and fills you with the Holy Spirit and allows you to be able to walk and be an example of Christ's likeness before your family in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the Holy Amen. Spirit, you can do it. Did you have a question, sister, or do you need... Uh... I, I did, actually. Go ahead. Just one more thing. Uh, I've... What, what about death threats? How do, you, oh, yeah. how do you go about dealing with that from family members? Well, I, I'll be honest, I wouldn't take them lightly. And you have the right as a Christian to appeal to the local authorities for protection because God uses various agents to protect you. He protects you by his Holy Spirit and his holy angels, but he also uses human agents like uh, uh, government agencies, police force to protect you. If you're being threatened, don't take it lightly. You know, to go to the police and file a complaint is not being unchristian. Because even in Acts 23, if you go to Acts 23 and you read from verse 16, Paul's nephew, his sister's son, told Paul there were a group of Jews who had taken an oath not to eat anything until they would kill Paul. Paul, as a Roman citizen, appealed to the Roman guards for protection, and they armed him with armed guards protecting him, you know, fully equipped with weapons, ready to kill anyone who would make an attempt on his life. If Paul could appeal to the protection of Roman soldiers, that shows you that as Christians, we can appeal to local authorities. So my, my advice to you, my strong advice to you is contact the police. Tell them you've been threatened. 
And don't let it go because take it seriously. There have been people killed in America called honor killings, right? Where Muslim women have spread mischief, like he was talking about fitna or, you know, fasad. And in order to remove the stain from the family name, a loved one, a family member killed that woman. And that brought them great honor among the Muslim community. So take it seriously, but don't get to the point where you despair because Christ, God Almighty, loves you and will protect you. And pray that he protects you. Pray that he gives you the grace to endure anything. Even if you have to die as a martyr, he's worthy because you're going to enter eternal life. He's real. But go to the local authorities and say, I've been receiving death threats, and these are serious. And trust the Lord to stir up their hearts to grant you the protection that God has for you. So do that. Paul did it. You can do it. It's in Acts 23. So I encourage you, contact your local authorities and find a church, solid church. Go to the pastor and say, this is my testimony. I used to be a Muslim. I love the Lord. My family's against me. They're threatening to kill me. And if it's a true church that loves the Lord, they'll get personally involved to help you find the protection that you need. So find a solid church sooner than later. And if you want, you can email me your information will be private just between you and I, and I'll try to find a, a local church that will be solid, loves the Lord, and will come to your aid. But send me an email. You can find my email by going to answeringislam.org, answeringislam.org. Go to individual authors, individual authors. Look for my name, Sam Shimoon. You'll find my email. Let me know who you are, and we'll take it from there by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, your life is in the hands of the Lord. Nothing can happen to you unless the Lord has a purpose for it happening. So trust in Him and use the means that God has given you to protect yourself. One of those means, local authorities. Just like Paul shows us in his example in Acts 23. Thank you. Anyway, I, anyway. I agree and I appreciate that. We appreciate you and your boldness and we pray God preserves Amen. you. Because if you're in the Holy Spirit, He'll preserve you. And we believe you belong to the Lord, so He'll preserve you. Amen. All right, well, you guys have a great night. And God too. bless you. Contact bless me you. if you need information, please. I will. Thank you. Lord bless you, sister. And that's a reminder for our audience who are watching this live and who will be watching it archived. You see the tribulations and the trials that these Muslims go through, even in America, who abandon Islam for Christianity. So Christians, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, pastors who are watching this, you, you need to be bathing these converts in prayer. Pray for this sister. Pray for C.L. Edwards. Pray for us. The Lord will intervene and preserve them because even in America, they don't feel safe. Can you believe this? They don't even feel safe in America because some Muslim will seriously go about trying to kill her. But we know Christ God Almighty is their preserver and her protector. Pray for these people and churches and pastors come alongside them, not just prayerfully, but in person. Take them in. Bring them in your homes. Provide for them and give them the community that they have lost. They lost one community. And now they need another. And that's what Jesus says. If you've given up families for me, he says that he'll give us a hundredfold in this life. Fathers and brothers and sisters. So she needs a Christian community. So churches, you know, step to the plate and meet her needs because it's a command of the Lord. You know, so I, I just hope that they'll come alongside her prayerfully. Amen. Amen. Did you want to say something else, brother, before we unpack some of these things? Oh, yes. Um, as you can see, this is real, right? This is not a game. Exactly. You know, people, when they leave Islam, you're putting your life on the line for Jesus Christ. Right. It's, it's, it's not a joke. You know, this is, um, this is not just, you know, I believe, you believe, and they believe, and maybe, maybe we, whatever. No, <laughs> this is <laughs> real. Yeah. This is real life. Exactly. You know, you heard what this young lady said. Her family, she has family members threatening to kill her because of her turning to Jesus Christ as Lord. This is not a game or a joke, and, I, and just all the Christians need to lift her up in prayer, lift all the ex-Muslims up in prayer, lift just, uh, like I told her, I tell myself and I tell you, stay in prayer. Amen. Fasting and prayer, we need it, because we're mighty in the Holy Spirit of the living God. Now, I don't know if we're coming up to the first break, because, I mean, the second break, I apologize. If we are, then we'll take it, but I'm just waiting for the word, uh, whether we're, it's a time for the second break. If not, let's just take the final call for now. And then, if it's time for a break, then we'll take the break, and then we'll continue discussing the evidence from the Bible that Muhammad is not a true prophet. Let's take one more call before the break. Uh, who's next? Who's next? Hello? Yes, hello? Yes, hello. 
How you doing, Brother Sham? Brother Sham? Brother Sham, huh? You're calling me a sham, huh? <laughs> See how you are? Milk yes. from your heart. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth yes. speaks. But go ahead. What's up, brother? Yes, uh, I heard you mention uh, in Galatians chapter 1, Six verse to nine, 8. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes? Yes, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Our time is coming oh, yeah, up, uh, so make it quick, brother. Okay, this is a comment. I heard you... you you referenced Galatians ch uh, chapter 1, verse 8. 6 to 9. Paul, 8 was part of it, but it's 6 to 9, yes? Yes, when he speaks of an angel coming even to corrupt the gospel. Yes. I think that might have perhaps been a flagrant, if not an explicit um, reference to Muhammad and the, the demon angel Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's just so sort of people understand what you're saying. Muhammad claimed that an angel came to him and gave him the revelations of the Quran, but the Quran contradicts the gospel. What Paul says would apply to him because Paul tells us that angels will appear to preach a false gospel to deceive people. And lo and behold, about 600 years later, here comes Muhammad saying an angel came to him with a different gospel. And yet Paul wrote this 600 years before this encounter Muhammad had with this angel. So you're right. Whoever this angel was, wasn't a righteous angel, but an evil angel condemned by the Lord Jesus Christ. 100% on the money. You're right. You have another comment to make real quickly? No, sir. God bless you, man, and keep praying for us. Pray for that sister, right? You see, this sister needs prayers for protection and God's people to come uh, to support her and surround her with love and the resources she needs. So pray for her. Pray for CL. Pray for us because we need the protection of the Lord, and he's God Almighty. Time for the second break, and after that, we'll go into some of the evidence. Amen. So time for the break. All right, we're back from the second break, and we only got about 28 minutes to cover uh, some ground so we're gonna have to hold off on the calls for now because we want to look at some of the nasty fruits of Islam proving that Muhammad can't be a true prophet now don't forget one of the criteria by their fruits you shall know them so is there any indication evidence that Muhammad produced bad fruits fruits that were so rotten that even a secularist would would cringe and be repulsed by hearing some of these fruits you better believe it now CL what did you want to share with us now I wanted to share with you that all of us as human beings have inside of us the moral law of God. We, have, we know there's a right and a wrong. We have a conscience. Even the Quran agrees with this. In Surah 7 and 28, Halali Khan uh, translation, and when they commit a fa'isha, evil deed, going around the Kaaba naked in a naked state, <laughs> every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse, etc., they say we found our fathers doing it, and Allah has commanded us to do it. Say, Nay, Allah never commands Faisha. Do you say of Allah what you know not? Wow. So Allah will never ordain something evil, rotten fruit, right? No. He would so never. That's what the Quran claims. Specifically, sexual innuendo, sexual perversion. Yeah, nudity, right? Oh, no, no, no. So he, would, he would never do these things. Can't do that, right? Okay, just want to make clear. Go ahead. He doesn't. And we know from the true Quran, from Romans 1, chapter 1, I suggest you read the whole entire Romans chapter 1, but. Paul says those who do all types of things like gossip, slander, foolish talk, deceitfulness, disobeying the parents, though they know God's righteousness, righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve deaths, they do it and approve of others who practice them. And by death meaning the judgment that will fall upon them when they stand before God's exactly. righteous judgment. And that's Romans 1 for the entire context, verses 18 to 32. Romans 1, yes. 18 to 32. So the Quran agrees here with the Bible that we know because God has created us in his image, right and wrong, instinctively because God has placed it in our hearts, even though we may suppress it and try to, uh, try to deny it, we know it. In suppressing, denying it, we give testimony that we're aware of it. Okay, now, with that said, you just read a passage in the Quran. The last thing Allah would do is ordain fahisha, meaning immorality, mm -hmm. filth, and perversion. Is that the case? Now, let me ask you and let me ask the audience. Yes. Would you, do you hold marriage in high esteem? I have to because the Bible holds it in high esteem. In fact, it's the first institution that God created. Man and woman coming together, being fruitful, multiplying, subduing the earth, right? Yes. That's right, exactly. So I would think a book that's uh, so profound in morality as the Quran yes. and the whole entire religious system of Islam would uphold the sanctity of marriage. Yes. It's right? you, exactly. like, you wouldn't be able to like, have sex with another man's wife. If I hate God and I hate his truth, then yeah, because unfortunately we have people who are wicked sinners, but we know that's evil. But because by the grace of God I love him, I would not dare touch another man's wife. 
In Jesus' name, may that never be done. Amen. But you wouldn't, like, marry a virgin temporarily, take your virginity, and then divorce her. If I do that, <laughs> I'm one sick, evil, unregenerate uh, beast, you know? I mean, no. So, what if I tell you Muhammad did these things, oh, and so, he commanded other, and he told other people they had permission to do those things? So let me understand what you're just trying to tell me. The Quran, it says that Allah does not ordain fahisha. No. That same Quran and the traditions of Muhammad, you're telling me that Muhammad actually allowed people to contract temporary marriages, yes. telling someone, look, I'm going to marry you for a short time and divorce you. Yes. And then also allowed them to sleep with married women, which yeah, is adultery? Yeah. Yes. Prove it. Give me okay, the proof. I'll give you one proof. I'll give you a number of proofs. Yeah, number one. one. Number one. Surah 4 and 24. Also prohibited women already married. So they're prohibited. Women all so married, already condemned. married are prohibited. Yes. But there's a clause. Oh, okay. Except those whom your right hand possesses, whom God has ordained against you. Wait, hold on. Let me understand this. So adultery is condemned. Yes. But not in every situation. There's a loophole. Oh, hmm, interesting. If the married woman is your right hand possession, then you can have your way with her. And what does that mean, right hand possession? For those of us who don't know the idioms of the Quran, what does it mean, right hand possession? To grasp her with your right hand, to have control of her. In other words, in plain English of today, she's a slave. Oh, so you mean the Quran not only talks about m having sex with married women, the married women that allows you to have sex with are slaves that you have taken captive? Yes. So it not only condones adultery in that context, it also condones slavery? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can have sex with these married slaves. And it doesn't say, you know, to wine her and dine her or, you know, buy her some, a bouquet of flowers to get her permission to have sets with her. It just says you can have sets with her. Well, if that's the case, then if you're right, your understanding, we should find examples in, in Muhammad's life where he implemented this. Are there any hadiths that tell, say what you just said, that they can take a woman captive, enslave her, and have sex with her even though her husband's still alive, but she's married? Sahih Muslim. Mm. You think that's uh, something that's... That's the that's second uh, most authentic <laughs> collection of hadith next to Bukhari. And in terms of authority, it's third in rank. First is the Quran, then Bukhari, then Muslim. Okay, let's read a hadith. Okay. Okay, Abu Surma said to Abu Sayyid al Qudri, mm -hmm. O oh, Abu Sayyid, did you hear Allah's messenger mentioning Al Azal? Yeah, and let me explain to the people what Al Azal is. Az al Azal is coitus interruptus. I don't know if I can even explain. <laughs> I'm really this embarrassed. This is a holy yeah, uh, yeah, test yeah. that we're talking about. For those of you who know what coitus, I said coitus, but it's coitus interruptus. Go back and look up the dictionary. Coitus interruptus. Let me leave it at that. I don't want to explain it because I don't want to offend my sisters who are listening to the show. Just go online, coitus interruptus, and you'll get, you'll understand. Go ahead. Well, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri, he says yes, and added, we went out with Allah's messenger on expedition to the Bil al Mustaklik, mm. and took captive some excellent Arab women. Oh, so here condones <laughs> taking women captive. Okay. Excellent women. Right. And we desired them. We desired them. Mm. So they want to have, they want to just play patty cake with them, right? No, they desired them. Yeah, they desired them sexually, obviously. Okay. For we were suffering from the absence of our wives. Wow. But at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. So we did decided to have sexual intercourse with them by observing uh, al azl and, and I I'm see that it actually pro provides, since the translators provide the definition. This, yes. I, I give you permission. Go ahead. Okay. Quote the it, because the this Muslim is the trans translator now. It's not him or me. Yeah. The English translator of Sahih Muslim, who's a Muslim, explains what azl means. Can you read? And it that me? means withdrawing the male sexual organ before emission of semen to avoid conception. Now let me break it down for the audience. Here we're told that the Muslims, when they attacked the place, they took some women captive who were beautiful, and they sexually desired them. Now instead of telling them, refrain yourself, control your lust by the power of Allah, Muhammad gives them license to have sex with them, and not only have sex with them, but to perform azil, coitus interruptus, which he just told you what it is, because these men didn't want to get them pregnant and be stuck with the kids. They wanted to have sex with these women, and after they gratified their filthy desires, sell them off as chattel, as property. And this is Muhammad's implementation of chapter 4, verse 24. Now, can you read me another hadith that explicitly says that this was also done to married women? What? Right? 
explicitly to married women. Let's let's see. It should uh, be in Sunan Abu Dawood, right? There's one there, isn't it? Sunan Abu Dawood. Uh, well, we have a next hadith from Say, uh, Sayyid Al Qudri again. The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Al Altas on occasion of the Battle of Hunain. We met their enemy and fought them, and they defeated them and took them captives. Some of the apostles, some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah, were reluctant, reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands, who were unbelievers. Now, understand what he just read, folks. Here were some Muslim men who had enough sense of morality to want to refrain from having sex with these female captives. Why? Because their husbands were present. Their husbands were still alive. Now, why would they want to refrain from wanting to touch these women? Because what did we say earlier? Every one of us, being human beings, are created in the image of God. Although sin has stained it, it hasn't effaced it. So they knew in their hearts, it is wrong to have sex with these women, although they are captives, when their husbands are still alive. Now, you would think that Allah and his messenger would agree, right? Allah and his messenger would say, hey, you're right. Their husband's still alive. Don't you dare get near them. Allah does not command Exactly. Aisha. However, continue reading, my brother. Uh, unbelievers in the presence of the, or the husbands who were unbelievers. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possesses. Wow, finish it, because this is interesting. That is to say that are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. Did you catch it? Instead of agreeing with, the, with his followers, Allah tells Muhammad, tell them, hey, don't worry about it, don't hesitate, I give you license, Go and have sex with them, even though their husbands are still alive. Now, Jesus tells us, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. In fact, there's actually a hadith attributed to Muhammad, where a man comes up to Muhammad, and this is, you'll find in Ibn Kathir's commentary. <clears throat> in fact, let me just bring it up real quick. I won't read it. It's in Ibn Kathir's commentary on chapter 17 of the Quran. And by the way, for those of you who want to read an abridged translation of Ibn Kathir online, an English translation, Go to Q, the letter Q, Tafsir, Q-T-A-F-S-I-R.com. You'll find the entire abridged English translation of Ibn Kathir's commentary. Check out his commentary in chapter 17, verse 32. A man comes up to Muhammad and says to him, give me permission to perform zinna, sexual fornication. So then Muhammad puts him aside and says to him, let me ask you a question. Would you want someone to have sex with your daughters? No. Neither do these people want you to have sex with their daughters. Would you want them to have sex with your wife, you know, your wives? No. Your mothers? No. And he goes through a list and he says, no. Neither would other people be happy with you having sex with their women folk. In other words, Muhammad is saying, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, and don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Excellent advice, but Muhammad didn't carry it out. Because I, I ask any and all Muslims listening to this, and Christians who are listening to this, which one of you would be happy for a Muslim man to attack your particular village, take your wife captive, and have sex with her in your presence, and then sell her off as chattel. Which one of you would be happy, happy with that, especially the Muslims listening to it? You know instinctively this is evil and rotten to the core, and yet Allah and his messenger permitted this for his followers. Now, according to Jesus, you'll know them by this fruit. This fruit is rotten. It's wicked, it is nasty, it's not only rape, because which woman in her right mind would gladly give herself to the very captive who just got done, destroying her village, killing her relatives, and which woman folk, would, would, which woman would gladly sleep with her captor when her husband is still alive? Someone who's morally deranged and maybe insane, but no morally sane, sound woman. But here again, the Quran says it's okay. And if it's okay, then you can't call it rape. If it's okay, you can't call it adultery. Adultery is only adultery if Muhammad says so. If he says it's not, it's not. Rape is only rape if Muhammad says so. If he says it's not rape, it's not rape. But you and I, and even you Muslim, who bear the image of God, know better. This is nothing more than rape and adultery. And this is nasty fruit. Muhammad can't be a true prophet of God. So that's just one. So, Go ahead. So just to, just to get this clear, this prophet who we're examining his fruit, he commanded people to do things. Not only did he contradict himself in statements, That's right. but he's contradicting the moral law that was found in the Ten Commandments of Moses, right? Exactly. Yes, 100%. And not only that, but it's written in, in our hearts. That's why I, I guarantee, without even having to know the people, 
and their reaction. I guarantee you there are people who just listened to this and cringed, mm -hmm. were appalled at what I said. But this is the authentic sources of Muslim. And we challenge any, any Muslim to call in and refute the evidence we presented. We're quoting your own sources, and we're quoting them in context. Authentic sources deemed authentic by your scholars. Muslims, there's no way around this. This is evil to the core. You need to turn away from Muhammad and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because time is fleeting, we have, an, we have time for one more nasty evil fruit that proves that Muhammad can't be a prophet. What about this thing that I hear called uh, Zawaj al muta also known as temporary marriage? What's that about? Can you tell me? Oh, temporary marriage. Yeah, explain to me and then give me the evidence for it from the Muslim sources. What is that all about? Help me understand what that is. Well, here's a hadith, another hadith. Uh, this is also in, in Muslim. Mm. Uh, Sabri Juhaini reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, permitted temporary marriage for us. So I and other people went out and saw a woman of ban ban Banu Amr and was like a young, long-necked she-camel. She <laughs> presented ourselves to, we presented ourselves to her for contracting temporary marriage. Temporary. Whereas she said, what dowry would you give me? I said, a cl my cloak, and my companion also said, my cloak, and the cloak of my companion was superior to my cloak, but I was younger than him. So when she looked at the cloak of my companion, she liked it, and when she cast a glance at me, I looked more attractive to her. She then said, well, you and your cl cloak are sufficient for me. I, reminded, I remained with her for three nights. Three nights he married her for a cloak? Three nights. Okay. And then Allah's messenger made peace be upon him, yeah. said, he who has any such woman with whom he had contracted temporary marriage shall let her off. Now I want, to, I want the audience to hear what you just read. Here's a man who's describing temporary marriage. What is temporary marriage? Muhammad allowed his companions to find women in a local area, in a village, and city, wherever they happen to be, and tell the woman, look, I want to marry you for a period of time, and then divorce you, and I'll pay you for it. In other words, look, I want to marry you for three days, and I'll give you a, my cloak, like the example you gave. And after we're done, we'll get divorced. And the, the woman says, okay. Now I want to again appeal to the audience, and I'm going to ask you a question. I want to again appeal to the audience, especially the Muslims who are created in the image of God. What would we call this today, going up to a woman, paying her a sum of money to have sex with her for a period of time, would we call that marriage, or is that an insult to marriage? What would we call this today? Now since the audience can't answer, I'm going to ask you, what do you call this institution of going up to the woman with the sole purpose of gratifying yourself sexually, paying her a sum of money for a period of time, and then dissolving that relationship and walking away, right, never to see her again unless you come back for another round? What would you call that today? I think according to uh, the law, that would be called prostitution. Exactly. How can you call this marriage? Marriage, the intention of marriage is to unite with a woman and remain with her indefinitely. Yeah. Unfortunately, in an imperfect world, circumstances then later arise, which leads to a divorce. But you don't go up to a woman and say, look, I want to marry you for a month and divorce you. Yeah. Which sane woman, morally sane woman, say, okay. Unfortunately, there were women at that time that accepted it. They go, okay, give me your cloak, give your money, have sex with me for three days, call it marriage, and then divorce me, and off you go. What makes it even more tragic? Two things. Some of these so-called temporary marriages resulted in the women getting pregnant and giving birth to illegitimate children because the man never intended to stay married. The man married her only for a short period of time, up to three days, even less than that according to some traditions, for a sum of money. But unfortunately, through such unions, some people got pregnant. Now let me give you an example. In Malik's Muwatta, and you can find this online, Malik's Muwatta, book 28, number 28.18, Point 42. And by the way, all of this is on our website, answeringislam.org. Go look under the section of Muhammad and the Quran, and you'll find detailed references giving you all the evidence to show you that this is what the authentic sources of Islam teach. Let me read what happened to one of these women who contracted te temporary marriage. Yahya related to me from Malik, from Ibn Shihab, from Urwa ibn Az Zubair, that Khawla ibn Hakim came to Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, and said, Rabiya ibn Umayya made a temporary marriage, muta, with a woman, and she is pregnant by him. So he went up to the woman and said, look, I want to marry you for a short period of time. 
when the time is over, I'll divorce you, but I'll give you some money. Unfortunately for the woman, she got pregnant. Umar ibn al-Khattab went out in dismay, dragging his cloak, saying, this temporary marriage, had I come across it, I would have ordered stoning and done away with it. Because according to some traditions, Muhammad allowed it, but then he canceled it. Other traditions say no, it was being observed all the way up to the reign of Umar, and then he stopped it. Whether it was stopped or not, the point is, Muhammad himself, in the name of his God, allowed his companions to find women and tell them, I'm going to marry you for three days and divorce you, and I'll pay you. And the woman who accepted it went ahead with it. And according to anyone with any moral sense, especially if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and are Christians, this is nothing more than prostitution, plain and simple. This is a na another nasty, evil, repulsive fruit of Muhammad, proving he cannot be a true, true prophet. And I pray in Jesus' name, Muslims, you see this for what it is. Turn away from it and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. The second point, Shiite Muslims, which is the second largest Muslim group to this day, actually believe muta, temporary marriages, is still lawful and it's never been abrog abrogated. In other words, non-Muslim women, you may have a Shiite man coming up to you and saying, oh, look, I'll marry you for a day and I'll give you a hundred bucks and after I'm done having sex with you, I'll divorce you. Will you go with it? Any woman with any moral integrity, with any moral sense, would be repulsed because that man is treating you like a prostitute. But don't forget where this teaching originates from. It originates from Muhammad himself. Therefore, in light of such nasty fruit, in light of Jesus giving us authority to be fruit inspectors, the fruits of Islam fail, proving Muhammad is a false prophet who stands condemned by our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me get, give you the last word, because we have about eight minutes. So do you want to say something, add something? Go ahead, my brother. I would like to add something, uh, the attitude that you should have towards marriage. Why is marriage so, what's so great about marriage? Why not, why not have a uh, temporary marriage, you know? What's, what's, what's really wrong with that? <laughs> yeah. what, what's wrong with that is the, the marriage is not merely to gratify yourself sexually. This is a part of that. I mean, God created sex. There's nothing yes. evil in it's itself evil, about yeah. sex. But when you take something and you use it improperly, that's when it becomes evil. Right. We know from Ephesians 5 and 25, a commandment, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right. Exactly. Right. Is it Christ-like to go to a woman and offer her a cloak so you can sleep with her for three days and then dump her after you, after you have sex with her? And if, maybe if she gets pregnant, who cares? You'll never take care of the child or see it again. Is that Christ-like? God forbid so. Is that godly? No. Ask yourself, Muslim, in your heart of hearts, is that godly? behavior. Yeah. You, there's no way you can say in your heart, I don't care what you, comes out your mouth, there's no way you can say in your heart that that's godly behavior. Exactly. So how can you be a prophet and engage in, command others, and watch others commit ungodly acts and ungodly behavior? Exactly. And say that's part of God's law, that God told you to do that. Yeah. Do you think God would tell you to do something God like that? God forbid such blasphemy. God forbid. In fact, to, to add what you just said, let me ask the Muslims the following questions, because this is what Muhammad did. I just quoted the narration. Look at Ibn Kathir's commentary, chapter 17, verse 32, when the man says, give me permission to fornicate, and Muhammad gave him a series of questions. Let me now turn it against the Muslims. Muslims, which one of you would be okay with a man coming up to you and saying, look, I want to take your daughter or your sister or your mother if she's a widow or divorced, or your aunt or your grandmother, and I want to marry her for three days, have all the sex I can for those three days, and then divorce her, and I'll pay her a sum of money. Which of you in your right mind would accept that? If you have any moral decency, you would condemn such a person and be highly offended. And yet this is what your prophet did to other people's woman folk. Related to that, which of you men would be okay with a group of men coming to your area, conquering it, taking you and your household captive, taking your wife captive, taking your daughter-in-law captive, right, or taking your daughter captive who's married, and then these men take your married folk, whether it's your wife, whether it's your daughter-in-law, whether it's your daughter who's married to someone, take your woman folk, have sex with them at will, as much as they want, even though the husbands are still alive, and then sell them off as chattel. Which of you Muslims would be okay with it? If you have any moral decency, you would condemn it for being evil and perverted, and yet this is what 
your Prophet did, and this is what the Quran allows you to do. In fact, for the non-Muslims, that command to take captive women, right-hand possession, and have sex with them even if, if they're married, that's a standing command that's never been aggregated. Chapter 4, verse 24 still applies in situations where Muslims conquer villages, cities, and towns, and take women captive. They're still allowed to rape these women, even if their husbands are still alive. Now, Muslims will say, look, it's not rape. Really? Let me ask you another question. Which woman in her right mind, which morally decent woman, would be okay and willing to sleep with someone who just got done murdering her village and her relatives? Which woman who's been taken captive in her right mind, who's morally decent and not insane, would be okay with sleeping with her captor when her husband is still alive? You know the answer. No woman who is morally decent and sane would allow it. Call it what it is, Muslims. It's rape. I know in Islam, rape is only rape if Muhammad says so. If he doesn't say it's rape, then it's not rape. For, thus, for us who are born of the Spirit, belong to Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, to have eyes to see and ears to hear, we call it what it is. We call a spade a spade. This is rape, plain and simple. It is rape, no more, no less. And temporary marriage, zawj al is prostitution, plain and simple. And we beg the Lord Jesus Christ to give Amen. you eyes to see that the fruits of Muhammad are evil. God gave us the authority to be fruit inspectors. We examined just two of the many evil fruits of Muhammad. And according to the Bible, he stands condemned. He cannot be a true prophet. He's under the feet of Jesus. And your only hope of salvation is to turn to Jesus Christ and confess him as your Lord and love him and cling to him because he loved you enough to die for you. And he's alive. And because he lives, you believe in him, you'll live forever and ever. And CL, I'm going to give you the last word before we close shop. This is not just some type of, uh, you know, cerebral, cerebral concept just inside of a book. Right. This is going on right now. Exactly. You can go online and you can look at uh, stories of women being raped all throughout Europe, women being raped in, in Islamic nations. There's a video online. Uh, it's a disgusting, but it, it is this. It's a video online of Muslims filming them raping a Coptic Christian oh woman God. in Egypt. God, and and Jesus but name. but why did why would they do that? Are they insane? Are they criminally insane? They did it because they're following the Sunnah and example of Muhammad and his companions. This is what Muhammad and his companions did. So it's it's just not a concept in a book. It's happening right now in a, in all across the world, and we see it. Now, if there ever comes a time when Islam starts to gain an upper hand in America. Yeah. Like, like it's done in some parts of London and in, in uh, France and certain, certain other areas, you're going to start seeing more of that here. You're going to see Christian women being grabbed by groups of marauding Muslim men and raped right. in the name of, uh, you know, taking the, the right-hand possession. Yeah. And they're going to justify it with the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. And if you're a Muslim and you say, I don't, hey, that's disgusting, that's wrong, then you, you have a problem. You have a problem inside your heart. Because this is what you're, the, I'm, we didn't make this up. Exactly. Again, nobody's bashing Islam on purpose. We're just reading from Islamic sources, authentic Islamic sources. So if you have a problem, you don't have a problem with us, you don't have a problem with ABN, you have a problem with the Quran and the Sunnah. You have a problem with Allah and his messenger. And if you have a problem with Allah and His Messenger, and I invite you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And with that said, I beg the Lord Jesus to arise. Arise, O Lord Jesus. And let your enemies scatter. Protect your persecuted church all over the world. Fill them with your spirit. Preserve them in your perfect power and love as they suffer persecution at the hands of disbelievers, including Muslims, who do not know you, who hate you and hate your people. Arise, O Lord Jesus, and be zealous for your glory. Come to the aid of your church, because you're God Almighty. And you're the perfect defender of your people, and we love you. Remember, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Maran Athe, amen, come Lord Jesus, and clothe us with your spirit to never deny you, but die for you because you're worthy, and we love you, O risen Lord Jesus. Amen. And we pray we love you forever. Good night, Lord willing, we'll see you soon, if the Lord wills. Take care.